this is Kelsey. I'm going to be doing a video about Edward Gaming today. I got my hair cut, and I thought, hmm, I look strangely like Easy Game. Uh, maybe I can tap into the pro player mythos, and this is a perfect time to do some video, maybe get some false authority, at least get people to ask me where Faker is, that kind of thing. So Edward Gaming, uh, going back to just what I'm going to cover here, their identity, I think of them as a Baron team, and I'm going to explain exactly what I mean by, by that, because I think when people think about Baron teams, they think stall out the game to 40 minutes, fight a Baron. And I think Edward Gaming's approach to using Bar Baron is a little bit more unique and has developed over the time period that they've been playing. So, of course, I'm going to start at the very beginning because I think their story and their organization and how it was formed and how the team was formed is very interesting. Then I'm going to talk about, of course, their playstyle now, how that's changed, the integrations of Dept and Pawn, their coach, I tend to give him a lot of credit. And then finally, I, since this is, is, is a pre-MSI video, I would like to do a little bit on how I think Edward Gaming is going to do at MSI versus some of the other top teams attending. Talking about the history of Edward Gaming, it's one of my favorite storylines of League of Legends in terms of how the, some of the players came together, the influence the coach has, where W, like the sheds, the remains of WE, and the, the rivalry that happened throughout 2014. It's a very interesting storyline. Uh, Frostgrown recently did a video on it, and she's much better at making this sort of information entertaining and funny than I am. She's, she's again, like, going back to the faker Easy Boon analogy, she's, like, the faker of the white females who talk about Chinese League of Legends, and I am, like, the, the, e the Easy Hoon, the slower, uh, I, I say more ums, I use more six, bom six bombs. Let's start with my take, my, my, what I find interesting about it and going back. I like to talk a lot about Aaron, and I like to give Aaron a lot of credit for Edward Gaming's success, and I don't really have this feeling about a lot of coaches, probably because I feel like Aaron's track record might be one of the longest and most successful, simply because you can go all the way back, and the thing that I think is very notable about Aaron's teams is that the players fit together in a unique way that's sort of unconventional is he's able to a lot of the teams have very unique strengths or weaknesses of a player that are enhanced or that they play in a different way within the context of the region and they've noticed one thing that they kind of exploit and play around that so I think and of course clear love <laughs> clear love always has to be something we talk about so I like to give Aaron a lot of credit and talk about him Aaron, I think, is kind of the catalyst and the major figure within the split of WE, which is where we're going to start here. So Aaron joined WE and has this reputation for having watched a lot of OGN. He used to go to Champions, like, every week, and he'd have his notebook, all these other things. Uh, he's Chinese, by the way, in case that's confusing. But he would take a lot of notes when he would go visit the, the Champions, and he decided that he was had this idea of, and had noticed some things, and really wanted to be an analyst or a coach for a team. So the speculation that a lot of, I guess, Chinese Reddit detectives, or I guess NGA detectives, because the forum's called NGA, uncovered is that he made up a sister, and he got, got her like a Facebook account, and a, a Weibo, a bunch of other social media stuff, and had this going for like three months, and then had her flirt with a the the support player at the time on WE. If it, it was called World Elite right then, he had him flirt with her, this fake sister, and they had this relationship going, kind of this this will they or won't they? And she eventually asks him out, and he says no. Okay, and then so the fake sister kills herself, <laughs> and so this this if guy feels so guilty that the sister kills herself, that he ends up getting Aaron a job as the analyst for Team Team World Elite, okay? And this this could be completely catastrophic and terrible, but then um, World Elite gets Clear Love and SCZF, actually, fun fact, Lucky, if you guys remember Royal Club Lucky from Season 3, was the first choice for the jungler to replace jungler that left after they, they failed champions. So... These are these are this is when it comes together, and this is a month before the season two world championship. If you can contextualize this new WE team with 
Salome, uh, Clear Love, Messiah, Wei Xiao, and FCZF forms, and they form a month before the Season 2 World Championship, which their previous roster had qualified for back in May. So they go to the Season 2 World Championship. They don't have uh, any group stage matches because they're the first seed, and if you remember, this was back when the, there were no group stage for first seed. So they played CLG EU in the quarterfinals in like one of the longest best of threes in the history because it lasted 11 hours. Uh, the the casters were going back and forth, like all these really long pauses, so many technical difficulties. So to this day, a lot of people talk about how, yeah, CLG EU one two one, but that series was just so. Uh, but there was a, there was definitely some issues with W when they went right. They only really had one strategy prepared, like their Blitzcrank strat, which was really fun to watch. And then after that got banned out, they didn't really have a lot to go to. And this was in part because they had just formed as a team, pretty much, and went to the World Championship. So following that, they end up going to a team called, a tournament called Enter the Dragon, an online tournament, with a bunch of Asian teams, Koreans, Chinese, whatever, and they just convincingly destroy everyone there. Papa Smithy said that after he casted that event, he predicted that they would go to IPL 5 and not drop a game winning that tournament. Of course, they did go to the IPL 5, um, if you guys know the format of that tournament, very convincing. They had like the top teams from NA, top teams from EU, they had CJ Blaze there. The format was very rigorous. So you had group stage, round robin, of course. Then they were seeded into a double elimination bracket, best of three. So it went through the tournament in such a way that, you know, they drop down, they come back up, all this stuff. There was really no resolution and WE while they were there they there they Faced Blaze, they faced Moscow Five, they faced Fnatic, and they faced CLG EU. I think I think there was one team that they didn't really face. I think it was TPA that got knocked out by CLG EU and Moscow Five, and then they were in the finals, and they dropped one game to Fnatic in the upper bracket final, and then they dropped one game to Fnatic in the grand final. So they only ended up dropping two games, and both were to Fnatic, and they they won that title very convincingly and there's a clip there's a video you can watch of them receiving their trophy and they actually like all five of them drag Aaron their analyst on stage right and they they're making he's he doesn't want to go no 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 I, I don't deserve it these kinds of gestures and he gets dragged on stage by the team and they're just they make him hold the trophy and just stand there so this idea that this analyst at this time, and of course Fnatic didn't have any coaches or anything like that, um, was just so valued by these Chinese players is very interesting. Over the course of the next year, the team starts to fall apart in Season 3 LPL, right? OMG starts to rise up, and OMG brings like the pick style of play with them, um, the all-in type, uh, the assassin, Ari. Those, those sorts of deals. They, they bring that to China and they make the games a lot faster and more consistent because IG always had a faster play, but they, they didn't have a consistent play style at all. So WE starts to fall and lose some favor. They were still predicted to go to Worlds that year. Actually, very few people thought, most people thought it was going to be OMG and WE going because IG, after winning the first regular season in spring, started to fall off really hard. Positive Energy, WE, Royal Cup are all tied for second in the summer as regular season, but WE just still seemed like the stronger team overall. Especially since I think they had uh, superior head-to-heads to both Royal Club and Positive Energy. They end up uh, obviously not going to reach all star. Uh, if you remember, Royal Cup Punk Suit. I keep calling them Starhorn, it's just second nature at this point. Um, Royal Cup Punk Suit and... OMG went. So after this, WE pulls it together for one last event, the WCG, and they lose to OMG in the semifinals there, and OMG loses to CJ Blaze. This is probably the last event I think that they attended as a team, and everyone knows that there's a lot of internal struggle, a lot of fighting going on. It comes out at the, after that tournament that Messiah is just so sad that his teammates are fighting so much that he retires, and then FCZF and Clear Love choose to leave the team, and, and Aaron kind of is approached 
by the owner to to make this team. And they also really want clear love. They call him their sine qua non, like or the 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 special. I, I, I don't speak French. The special something. Every time people talk about clear love, they say he has the special something. Like you can't exactly say why he's a good player, <laughs> but he has this something that is that makes teams feel makes them successful. Makes him successful. So they get. They they grab Aaron, they know they want Clear Love, and they want RCZF. But because there's there's this huge fracture, the team just breaks apart and there's this brief period of re renaissance for both WE and Edward Gaming following that. But getting before we get there, it's this is when some of the stuff comes out in the community. And no one's really sure how much Aaron's um way that he got into WE had to do with him splitting up. It may not have had anything to do with it at all, but there was definitely extreme loyalty coming out of Clear Love and SCZF to this guy that they would choose to break their contracts with WE and follow him to Edward Gaming when the team was suffering. And and WE and Edward Gaming were going to form some sort of partnership, but that fell through also. Before going into this formation, this creates this period of time where. <clears throat> World Elite and Edward Gaming, their fan bases are at extreme odds. Edward Gaming almost doesn't even have a fan base. Um, WE PR doesn't really tell people they can't have these strong feelings, but they they don't they don't necessarily encourage it either. There are there are moments where people who are actually employed by the w WE organization do come out. They're very, very harsh, very, very hard against Edward Gaming. They call them betrayers, um, the the traitors that broke the team apart. And there's actually a moment where a graphic artist for Team World Elite co goes on Weibo and says, I hope Clear Love gets hit by a car. Wish House girlfriend, who does some of the interview work for the LPL, set, came out and, and just blatantly asked, you know, WE is doing better this split because Conan is a better player than FCCF and Raw is a better player than Clear Love, right? right? That's happening, that's how that is. So there's a lot of backlash. Um, actually, it's supposed that Edward Gaming players were told not to talk on stream, just not to give these WE well, fans ammunition to turn against them. So there's a funny story with that where Clear Love would just play music and he played a lot of sad love songs. So people started calling him the Esports Love Song Prince, until some fans asked him, you know, you always just play these sad songs, it makes me so sad, can you play a happy song? So he Googled, like, doesn't Google, they use Bing. Um, he looks up a happy song, and it, the first song that pops up is Ocha Joy, so he plays Ocha Joy for a while. So people start calling him then Esports Beethoven. But I haven't really gotten into yet what the team of Edward Gaming looked like initially, okay? So they get Coral 1. Because Coral One was a mentee of Clear Love, and he was recommended to the team by Clear Love, and I think it, it kind of works out because Coral at the time was known as a tank-only player, and Clear Love liked to play those assassins, the assassin-type jungles that were coming in meta again, and he wanted to be that secondary carry of the team. Uh, he always had the style where he loved to farm the jungle. He, he was less of a proactive jungler, and this worked really well for him because Messiah liked to play a lot of high map pressure. He wasn't very good in laning phase, but he liked to play like a Twisted Fate. Um, he liked to build Moby Boots on his mid lane champions. So that relationship worked really well. They actually sometimes played this style on WE where they let Clear Love play Zed and just, just have him farm for like 30 minutes before they would even drop a tower. Because Wei Xiao was really good at controlling sideways and slow push situations. So they could extend the laning phase for a really long time and just let Quillo farm, and he could come out of 30 minutes with like four items uh, and never show up on the map. So this was Quillo's natural style. He wanted to play the secondary carry role, and Coral was really good at tanks, so it worked out. They got you as a mid laner because again, if their approach is to extend laning phase, um, they're going to want someone who's very good on those types of utility mages. Of course, to this day, you will say he does not like to play those champions. He would rather play Zed. His play on Assassins hasn't been bad, but it's he's just a mage-style player, and that's what people know him as. Speaking of Easy Hoon, 
uh, they they pick up Name, who has this reputation of being the best BD carry at the time, and he says, he comes out and says, and this doesn't want him any fans, that he will be better than Wei Xiao. And then you have FCZF, of course. And a lot of people like to say FCZF was like the Chinese Mad Life. I always think of FCZF as a much a very passive laner on both WE and Upper Gaming, but his team fight engages are really, really good. And he's a bit of a one dimensional support player, but his engage sense is really strong. So he was the primary ca shot caller and the captain for this 2014 Edward Gaming. Now, that's, that's the team that forms then. Their philosophy and approach to the game is always going to be, as FCZF said, uh, don't lose lane, stay lane, don't lose Baron. So they end up falling behind a lot, just by not playing proactively. They fall behind quite a bit, and they play a little bit like Samsung Blue, is probably the best analogy I can give, is that they fall behind like 10,000 golds, and then they win a Baron fight at 40 minutes, right? This is the thing that I said that they don't do, but this is very much how they played in 2014. They win a Baron fight at around 40 minutes, completely turn the game and end the game that way. And they can do this in part because Yu is very good at stalling at the lane phase. Because Koro good is, is very good at playing the team fight but from behind. Like, he would lose lane a lot. He got a lot of criticism for playing this kind of passive style and getting get his teeth kicked in, even by like these top laners who aren't that good. <clears throat> but Name, I think, is actually the anomaly on this team. He's a actually known for usually being very aggressive in the early game. So him and FCZF didn't ever quite synergize, and I think he was actually kind of a weird pick for that team. You saw early on in the split, he would play like a lot of Twitch, and he would do a lot of roaming. So it was almost like he was the messiah of EDG early on, and clearly, like, you was there to hold lane, Philip was there to farm, and wait, almost like Name was the map pressure guy, right? And he did this a lot really well with Jinx too, because he could just fire the Jinx rocket across the map and sometimes get kills that way. And he had this insanely high kill participation for an AD carry for the first half of the year. And the, again, in the first half, they, they can beat pretty much anyone except OMG. And then eventually in IET, when, when Jinx does come out, they, they 2 0 OMG at IET. Part of this is that Koi Love Gang Smith, okay? And she has not. Shi Young, excuse me, is not comfortable in the middle. In the summer season, I actually think Edward Gaming were more passive than they were in the spring. I talked a little bit about how Nami would play a more active map pressure role. Clearlove started to take over the map pressure role very slowly in the spring playoffs, and Nami started to play much more passively, much more team fight focused overall. So this is where Edward Gaming didn't really have a map pressure force because Clearlove was very inconsistent. You stayed mid lane, didn't really roam. Name stayed lane, didn't really roam. And they just had this very stay lane, get better, win game approach still. Just completely. No one, no one really did anything. And during the, the summer playoffs, Clearlove played his role really well. He ganked aggressively. The team got early leads. They they had a moment where OMG actually surrendered at 20 in the final. So this was the the best team against the second best team. Now, unfortunately, if you, you hadn't walked through the regular season, you didn't see this inconsistency in Edward Gaming. But the thing that hit them really hard was that they couldn't come back anymore because Name at Worlds didn't have the best tournament. Uh, they still had that one fight against Samsung White, but you could tell there were some fighting. There were some issues, at least that's what they said in the documentary, that there were a little bit of squabbles, a little bit of disagreement, the team was just really down, they started to not really win a lot of the scrims out worlds, Name didn't perform, Clear Love didn't perform, worlds just did not go well for them. So the team splits apart again, and this is when they get some of their new acquisitions, the, the pawn, the deft, and we begin to see a new team developing. And for this, I always like to start with the famous Snake 2.0 of Edward Gaming, is when you start to see that the Korean acquisitions aren't fully integrated into the team yet.
initially in the Snake series, I think was a really big eye-opener for Edward Game Enthusiasts. First of all, they didn't get 2-0'd again, ever again, the entire 44-game season, they never got 2-0'd again, uh, after the second week. But this was when they started to see that Deft and Pawn weren't strict substitutions for Name and Yu. They couldn't just play their same style. Like, Clearlove had to buck up, essentially, because Clearlove played very passively these games. He just kind of tottered around, his little new new face, um, did some counter jungling, did some farming, didn't really have any map pressure, and Deft got ganked a ton. Deft just overextended. Um, he didn't really have the sense that he's developed now for laning phase. At the very beginning, he tended to overextend or he tended to half commit. And this isn't necessarily a criticism of Deft, it's just that in the Samsung Blue era in particular, Deft played a much more reckless laning phase. And he would give up kills because they had this great team fighting mid, they had this great team fighting topic, they had this great team fighting package. And even if, if Nami gave up kills in lane, they had a really great team fight to answer to, and you could stall out ways. Pawn wasn't going to play that role, right? He wasn't going to be this team fighting guy. He was going to be the, I'm going to do crazy things in lane guy. Sometimes I'm going to die, sometimes I'm going to not, but I'm just going to be this crazy guy. Um, I can do really well in 1v1s, and when I get lane leads, I'm going to pressure them really hard, so that's going to separate, differentiate me from you completely as a player. So, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the team fighting guy. And that's where EDG had to reevaluate their playstyle. And I think the next time, the very next day, like overnight, their approach changes. Clear Love is playing Lee Sin, okay? He's much more proactive, he's ganking lanes. When they do the lane swap, everyone just comes down and ganks flame for Deft. So Deft is getting all of this lane pressure suddenly. And Deft's lane gets boosted up. He goes from going 1 6 to like. 9 to like 10 0 or something the next day. So it's pretty insane. Like the, the, the fact that it was literally an overnight transformation. And then the next week they get Mako, who I think his, his vision is it's significantly better than Mouse's. Um, because they had Mouse for the first two weeks. It wasn't that suddenly, oh, Mako and Def's synergy are ma magically better in this week. No, it's a different guy. I'm sorry if you didn't pay attention. No. Um, that wasn't a shot at anyone in particular. Please don't know. Uh, but they do much better with vision, and Mako is actually much better at roaming than Mouse. So they end up forming this tandem roaming squad with Mako and Clearlove, and sometimes Korra 1 does it, because Korra 1 was doing significantly better in lane, and I actually think the major differences between Edward Gaming 2014 and Edward Gaming 2015 is how they're, how Korra and Clearlove play, like, strangely enough. It's not that Pawn and Deft are like these completely, oh, they carried the team. Koro is a much better top laner now. He's significantly better. He's crazy uh, uh, miles better. He can play carry roles. He can play from behind. He's never going to be like this huge carry, but he can beat a lot of people in lane that he couldn't beat before. Um, he's not going to lose lane every game. He's still going to have this crazy team fighting presence, and he can play other types of roles. Clear love is... I was a crazy Lee Sin player this split. I didn't think I'd ever call Clear Love a Clay crazy Lee Sin player, but the fact that he got so many kills and was so proactive as Lee Sin just and this happened seemingly over or overnight for Clear Love. Coral, this was a slow evolution and you could see it happening, but for Clear Love it literally seemed to happen overnight. Overnight, and there, there were definitely periods where he did it last year. It was like this inconsistent up down, but then he suddenly had this consistency that lasted until the patch changed. So, that's that's where they were. And I called this this three roaming, these three Chinese, like I call them the, the Chinese Mafia or the Chinese Escort Service, because they would just repeatedly gank for Deft, or they would repeatedly gank for Top Lane, or they would repeatedly gank for Pawn. I actually noticed that maybe the one time where Pawn really gets camped by these players is against Invictus Gaming. And the reason why they do this against Invictus Gaming is because Rookie is such the carry of that team. Uh, they did it a little bit against OMG, less so. But definitely against Invictus Gaming, because Rookie Rookie is the, the main force, the main threat in that team, and so that's when they'll camp Pawn. Otherwise, he... 
he roams on Kassadin, or he has this really unique style, and I think in order to explain how Pawn fits into this game, because it's so weird, I'm going to have to show you some clips. So first of all, let's look at some of these claims to fame Pawn has. In 44 games, he played 19 different champions. That's actually extremely significant. That's a different champion almost every other game, right? Because that would be 22 champions. Now, a lot of these champion picks are really weird. Like, you have the Vigar mid. I don't think anyone really played Vigar mid. Even when it was popular support, no one was really playing it mid. You have Lux. Who played Lux this split? Jace. Who played Jace this split? Like, obviously Jace is a good pick, but then you have the Fizz picks that happened post-Fizz nerf. Like, all of his Fizz- he didn't actually pay fi play Fizz when it was- when AP Fizz was good in, in meta. He pay played it after the- Fizz changes that made it a better like top lane pick with with AD. He picked Riven, he picked a Morgana. After a while you're kind of and, and then he picked Corky mid, and Corky mid was good for a while, but he didn't even pick it when Corky was mid was good, okay? He picked it like before Corky mid was good on the patch with the Lin's Echo Corky. So you just kind of start to look at these picks and you start to wonder, okay, why? Why is he playing these things? Like, is it a good idea to actually play these out of meta champions? Is it just that, like, Pawn is so ridiculously good that he can play anything and it'll go well? And the answer is no. No, he's actually... that's actually not the case. Because you see in a lot of these games where the team will win, but he go he has a negative scoreline. He, he goes, like, one... he goes, like, one in six in one of his Lux games against Ganty. Like against Ganty! We're talking about Ganty. Um, and so it's just really weird. But going through the videos and piecing through, you start to realize that Pawn has a very unique identity and a very unique role on Edward Gaming that very few players have ever actually been able to effectively execute. And I don't, I can't really think of anyone who did this in the middle. I can think of a couple top lane examples, but but pawn, but in the mid lane role, this is like I don't really can't think of anyone. Just gonna briefly show a few things. This clip is from a WE game against UDG, and pawn just kind of walks out of lane here, and they know that they kind of have a guess or trajectory where Spirit is because he was down bottom camping, and so they sent him in to kill Spirit. This case, he just gets kind of repeatedly because he's playing immobile Lux. Here, this is like one of my favorite pod moments. It's just pretty hilarious. Like he literally chases Dade across the map like an idiot while um, the rest of Edward Gaming groups to take this tower. In the scheme of things, Pond goes a little too ham this game and I do think some of his weird plays cost them. So they end up in the situation where there's two base races between M3 and EBG. So they do almost lose this game, but this is just kind of an example of some of the weird shit he does. Um, yeah, he gets killed. And then here, this is like a more standard when you think of Pawn or when you watch play. And then I think a lot of people, when they see stuff like this, like they pick a counter pick and he just like starts winning the lane in a standard way. Show those brief examples because I think. When I describe the role Pawn has on a team, people will tend to react in a negative way. The, I, I describe him as Darian. And this is the, the, the thing, right? The Mascal 5 Darian is probably the most famous example of what I think Pawn does. And Insec on KTB, when he used to play top, did very similar things. Where his job is literally just to pull pressure. And he does this in the first case I showed you against WE, where he just goes in and he kills Spirit. He does it in the second case against Gamty, where he's picking like this immobile champion, almost as a come gank me sign, right? Lux isn't going to get away from stuff, like Jace isn't going to get away from stuff. Twisted Fate, he did this against LGD, right, in the fifth game. Twisted Fate isn't going to get away from anything. Lulu isn't going to get away from anything. Uh, Jace isn't gonna go anywhere. Like, he picks a lot- Vigar- no. He picks a lot of champions, actually, that are very immobile relative to some of their mid laners. And he gets away with it by just pulling pressure. It's- it's his come gank me sign. The third example I showed you 
was where he's chasing people around the map where EDG is, while well, EDG is getting a tower. He does that kind of thing all the time, especially with champions like Fizz or like highly mobile champions. Like, so this is the other side of the coin. And then the, the fourth example is I think when people think more about Pawn, they think about he's got, okay, he's got the counter matchup and he's going to get solo kills on the other guy all day. And this is a much more traditional, and I, and I hesitate to say traditional because I think he only started doing this towards the end of his, of the part of his career where he was in Korea. For a lot of it, he played safely, but he started doing this towards the end and he did it at Worlds, and he does it much more commonly now, where he does pick the counter matchup and he just solo kills the enemy mid lane. All of these ways are just ways to pull the jungler. These are ways to relieve pressure. These are ways to make sure you're not killing deft. EDG's entire objective is to get deft ahead. That's the entire purpose. They will send several people to gank for deft, and then they'll have Pawn like, pull the jungle away from deft. So that there isn't a situation where EDG is outnumbered in the bottom lane. Options are going to be in cases where there's this super mid laner who's known to be the primary carry of the enemy team, like Rookie. Like for example, I would expect them to have a similar strategy where actually they do camp pawn and they do get pawn ahead against Faker. So that's where I think of pawn, and that's where I put pawn. Meanwhile, his team fighting is not as good. Like his the way he plays Lulu for me is really strange because. As Lulu made, you just want to peel for your AD carry, right? You just want to use that wild of growth, you just want to use the whimsy, you want to stay back, you want to be a part of that back line. But he's like going in with Coral all the time, and his Lulu stat is really misleading, like a 5-0 Lulu? What, what is that? So just for me, Pawn isn't the team fighter, and there are subtle ways where he will misposition. Like he mispositioned in a GAMT game when he did play Cookie Mid in a team fight, and GAMT almost had a comeback window out of that. So there are just subtle things where Pond's team fighting isn't quite there still, though I do think his team fighting has improved significantly, and I still think he's a very, very good mid laner, obviously, but his role is very unique. And I don't think enough attention has drawn to the fact that his role is so unique. Um, that he's not going to be the primary carry, but he's going to be like the crazy guy who makes it so the primary carry can't succeed. The one player I haven't really talked a lot about is Mako. I think Mako is a more well-rounded, this is going to sound terrible, and I'm probably going to get so much hate from the FCCF fans, but I think he is a more well-rounded FCCF. He's still very, very good at the engagement, and very good at that, but I think he also has a more aggressive laning aspect, and I think his vision control is is interesting in the fact that he almost at times seems like clear love support rather than deft in terms of his roaming. So I think that there are hints that I don't think Mako is yet, like the, the player that FCCF is. He's still pretty inconsistent, but I think he actually has the potential to be a better player than FCCF. So that will probably take a while for him. Kralov comes from a, or F Mako comes from a team called Reunion, and a team with Kway, the jungler for Gansi, and they were kind of the, the shiny parts of, of Re Reunion, and they took down Starhorn Rock Club and NEST qualifiers. So they had some moments of brilliance, and it's good to see Mago on a lineup now. At this point, I've, I've drawn this picture of a super aggressive roaming like squad with this like really propped up AD carry who just like goes gangbusters and kills people in team fights, and this mid laner who's pretty much Darian, who can have a, a huge impact in terms of pulling jungle pressure, and as long as he does that, it doesn't matter if he's like 0-6 or 6-0, right? And that's the picture of Edward Gaming that was predominant for most of the split, and I think there are definitely still echoes of this. I think Koilov definitely still has some of the jungle pressure on some of the tanks, but it's not as early, and it's not as... holistic. He does, He's gonna farm a little bit more now that the patch has changed and the Tank jungles are coming. This is where we talk about clear love. And everyone knew it was coming, right? The clear love talk has to come eventually because I'm making this video and I have a weird clear love obsession. I don't even consider clear love like one of my favorite players. He just is very confusing to me. I, I don't really understand him. I think I. Part of the big appeal of Chinese League of Legends is trying to understand the the thing that Clearlove has, right? 
and I, I describe it as team fighting because I think his team fighting is actually really exceptional. His team fighting is really strong on tanks. His team fighting is really strong on assassin mids. He even has some like interesting Lee Sin engages, but he just definitely has this really cool approach. Or this angle of approach is really strong. His Sejuani ults are usually ridiculously on point. The fact that he's able to get into four people with Cora one. And when I recently published an article about Claire Love where I talked about his gold distribution and Edward Gaming's gold distribution, when you look at the gold distribution in LPL, it's actually, per role, it's actually very similar across roles because when you play so many games, eventually things start to go, start to normalize a little bit. So you get an a, a very, a lot of players really close to the average percentage of team gold in jungle role. Players really close to the average percentage of team gold in top lane role, in mid lane role, and in AD carry role and support. The unique thing about Edward Gaming is that they actually have the smallest gold distribution uh, per laner. So top lane, Koro has the smallest of any top laner of percentage of team gold. Mid lane, Pawn has the lowest of any mid laner of percentage of team gold. AD carry, Deft has the lowest of any AD carry a percentage of Dean Gold. Clearlove gets almost as much gold as Pawn. He gets like 21.62 and he Pawn gets 21.68. Okay? So you're thinking about these crazy mid laners who get like all this team, team gold, these crazy AD carries who get all this team gold. Clearlove almost gets as much gold as his mid laner. And his he gets 15% um, more of the ju the jungle average in proportion of his team gold, and that is the biggest differential from uh, a role average of any role in LPL. So Clearlove gets a significant amount of his gold, and he gets this because he has a lot of kills. Like if you watch an Edward Gaming game, you'll notice he doesn't die very much. He gets a lot of kills. He actually has this really insane like nine something KDA after he got a lot of these kills, and that was what he did early on. Now that he's farming more, he gets a lot of gold from farming. He also gets a lot of assists. His kill participation, again, is going to be the highest on his team. In the end, though, the reason why Clearlove has so much gold, people are like, why are you doing this? Are you trying to prove that he's a carry? I'm not trying to prove that he's a carry with a gold star. I'm trying to talk about why Death succeeds. And people are going to roll their eyes and say, okay, Kelsey is saying that 80 carries are so good on Clearlove's team because of Clearlove, and she's completely insane. But if you look at his zoning and the amount of work he's able to do as a frontline player, or the amount he's able to do as like a second carry, uh, Deft is, is super safe a lot of the time. And part of this is attributed to Koro, because I think Koro is this really great uh, team fighting top laner as well, so there's just this big zoning, but having that much gold on your jungler, and this is the argument people always used in Cloud9 for Meteos, right? Is that if your jungle is able to farm this much and have this much gold, then you have like a very, very effective presence in team fight. And people instead say, oh, Quillov can get the gold from kills now, right? So he can be effective in team fight. People also have used this for, for Dandy, that he's like this crazy, like past 20 minutes, he's really effective because he gets more gold than most junglers on Samsung White. So the fact that you have a situation in this new patch where Clearlove is still able to get a lot of gold and have a big impact in team fighting or in early presence is really significant for the way EDG plays. Now, I'm going to talk about EDG and Baron and Dragon. And the question now is how does Edward Gaming play now? Like what, what what elements of their style? How do they make use of clear love getting so much gold? Um, how do they make use of Deft as this really great late team fighting AD carry? And then how do they still make use of Pawn? I think Pawn's role has more or less remained the same, but a lot more goes into the team fighting. Like they go all in on clear love's team fighting, on Quora's team fighting, on Deft's team fighting. And part of the way they do this is they have this very unique strategy where they don't prioritize dragon nearly as much as baron and people say that oh their dragon control is really weak but part of it is is that they pick comps much more towards targeting in the late game or sometimes not even team fighting at all and just getting the baron and being able to just shred through towers with a baron buff and it's a very risky play style the reason why it's risky is because they're effectively bet 
thinking that okay maybe we get one dragon or or no dragons and we predict that we can win the game with a baron buff before the enemy team gets five dragons. So when we say that Edward game is a late gaming team, that's actually wrong. They don't want it to go to late game because they don't want the enemy team to have five dragons. They're much more of a mid game baron team, which is really awkward. But sometimes when we talk about how they're poor in lane swaps, what really hap what we really mean is that sometimes they might even get more kills, but they end up doing poorly in early trades. So they come back around mid game with team fights and they get like these 25 minute barons. So if you don't have baron warded at like 20 minutes, you're pretty much SOL against Edward Gaming because they will almost consistently always go for that. And then they'll try to wreck your base and destroy your base before you can get enough dragons to fight them effectively. So here's the, the first example where they have this Jinx Nunu comp against Invictus Gaming. And Invictus Gaming makes the choice to go for a fourth dragon as a trade for EDG getting the Baron. And the way they distribute pres pressure between their, their 4 one split push and when they choose to rotate Koro is how they get so many towers off of this Baron buff. So here Edward Ga Invictus Gaming goes for the dragon. Edward Gaming chooses to rotate instead to the Baron. And this is a really questionable trade on IG's side. I think the reason is, is that they're trying to bet, okay, we can get five dragons before you can destroy their base. We'll give away the first Baron, but it's fine. We'll catch you because they, they do have a much better team fighting comp overall than Edward Gaming does. And Edward Gaming then immediately, this is their first move after getting Baron, is they immediately rotate towards this tower and just destroy it. And then they back and they continue their reign of terror. This is how they use the rest of the Baron. First, they immediately all go bottom, except for Pawn. And again, they're using Pawn to sort of try to alleviate pressure. This is something that he continues to do throughout the game, not just make game off doing his thing. But the really curious thing here is that how consistent they are with their pressure. They're able to maintain the appropriate amount of distance, uh, having Koro in the front line when they siege like this, and having Mako like always stand a little bit close to to deck. If, but a little bit back so that if someone comes in, he'll knock them back into the thing and they can't get to Mako in this regard. Meanwhile, Pawn is pushing in and he's able to use this distortion to make them sure the minions get really close to the tower with the improved Baron. And IG is just forced to put a bunch of wards up here. So I think Edward Gaming is aware of where the wards are because when they start to transition Koro, which should be fairly soon, Let's just watch them continue to pressure here. Right, they can't get at depth because of the threat of the Nunu and of the, the Jonas. So they did transition Koro around it. People saw Koro transition. So they immediately start moving Pawn back. And they'd already moved pressure. And because of the rate at which Koro and, and LeBlanc can move, they can have this five-man push like very suddenly at the bottom. And they're able to get... Uh, the inhib on the last wave at which they have the Baron buff and break the base so they get so much out. Now this is from the first EDG versus LGD game. It has first of all some really good team fighting from Edward Gaming. L LGD flanks around and they get this death pickup, but then um, PYL uses Koro is able to get the Gnar ultimate into the wall into the Nunu ultimate. So they get two kills right there. Uh, Clearlove saves the, the snowball, and actually I think Acorn accidentally smites the minion instead of Mako, so that was a little bit of a misplay. The big misplay on EDG's part here is over committing for the kill onto Godby. So Pawn goes in, he obviously gets poked down. The smarter thing to do you would think would be to go for the dragon, right? Um, but I think like you have Deft beginning to rejoin you, but instead they really overcommit for this kill onto Godby. Quirrell takes way too much damage, and then a s snipe from Imp kills Pawn, so they can't get this dragon. So LGD ends up getting the objective after the trade. Um, so that's an issue with some of their uh, early game trades. Finally, this is just an issue where Edward Gaming takes like a really poor fight when they shouldn't have in an, for an early dragon. And this is something I just wanted to highlight, because their decision making, I think, is, has some inconsistencies. 
let's talk about some of EDG's team fighting and why it's so good. So here they're like 6,000 gold behind. Korra 1 ends up porting to that location to set up the flank. And the way that Ever Gaming uses this side terrain, so Deft is completely outside the fight right now. Mako grabs Imp successfully and Pawn just completely obliterates him. And then when Clearlove enters, he pinchers off so that TBQ and PYL are stuck in his ice tundra. I don't know what the abilities calls him, not a shot caster right now. Um, and they end up killing those people off so, because his Deft can effectively use that terrain like extremely well. And he only has to deal with Acorn, who does pretty much no damage. So the fact that they have no... They're really, really far behind, but they manipulate the terrain and the hook and just like the landscape really well is why they win. The famous uh, Edward Gaming final pentakill team fight. Coral 1 teleports in. This was an extremely risky Baron on LGD's part. I think they were three dragons up at this point, so they could have easily just stalled out. Um, Clear Love here, very key, soaks up this huge ultimate and ends up doing locking up the LGB team as they try to kite off from him. Corwin also kites away from the team. Pawn actually had that port, if you notice, that was like really ineffectual. Um, so he doesn't actually do a lot this fight, despite the fact that he got a lot of hype in the Reddit thread. He did hit Imp with the gold card, you'll see here, but Imp immediately cleanses it and just walks back into the boomerang blade for no reason. So like the that hype is over overdone. But the thing is, is that the fact that Edward Gaming's members are able to get so many of LGD's targets knocked up and to use their AoE on them so that Def can just like clean up for the foot skill is the crux of the EDG team fighting. And they took a gamble, they got the Baron, they won the game. To review why I would choose to show you those clips. First of all, we saw that Edward Gaming has really good team fighting. Some of their early game is more based on the fact that they might get good kill trades, but bad objective trades. And Sometimes they just opt into dragon fights, so most of the time they will choose to just go for one dragon, and then I think it's the early time when they're trying to get the first dragon is when they screw up. Because they want one dragon, but getting subsequent dragons, a lot of times they'll just choose not to. They'll just completely ignore it, because they know that their strategy is 25 minute barons. And very rarely are you going- you're, you're not going to get a 25 minute 5 dragon, right? So their strategy is to get the the 25 minute Baron and try to break your base at before 30 minutes effectively so that it becomes much harder for you to contest subsequent dragons and subsequent Barons. LGD and Invictus Gaming like choose to opt into these Baron fights. And the question is, why do they do this? A lot of times it's just like, just, just don't, right? Just ignore it. Um, but if you know Edward Gaming is going to go for Baron at like 20-25 minutes, then your option R is is to ward the area better so that you can contest it and kind of catch them out, which is probably the best approach. Or to, but even even still, because they're Baron team fighting and the fact that they understand how to manipulate terrain, they understand their power specs. They they draft very well for getting to your back line, and for for also protecting their own. They use Sejuani, Nar very well, like these kinds of, of picks extremely well. You, you still realize that there might even be a risk if you're going to interrupt their 20 minute Baron. The question is how do you keep the Baron away from them? And that's, that's the biggest pitfall that I think a lot of LPL teams fall into, is that sometimes they might proactively do it when they shouldn't, and they should just keep the area awarded, and they should just try to catch EDG out at Baron. But you know that if EDG does get Baron, they're very good at using it and at destroying your base. So that's like the catch-22. But again, like the, the safer play, and this is why I think SK Telecom has a slight advantage at MSI, is because they're able to manipulate these early game trades to make sure that they get the better objective pulls than Edward Gaming does, and then they're also smart enough, I think, to try to get picks at Baron rather than contesting it full on or trying to 5v5 or trying to rush it themselves. I'm not entirely sure. I think that also Aaron has made the statement that... They are 10%, were at 10% of their full power with LGD because they hadn't been really practicing. And maybe part of that is that Pawn wasn't practicing his team fighting. 
they weren't able to practice their calls in some of these uh, five point post five point six games, but I think they saw had these same struggles in week eleven against Fiji Gaming. I am concerned about their play on the new patch, and they're extremely risky, like Baron all in play style, foregoing dragons and choosing not to play the five dragon race. I think it'll make them very unique and very strange and very hard to prepare for by teams. What I would suggest. Just on a pure level, I understand that teams are limited to compositions and they want to prioritize getting what's good for them. But just just purely and definitively, like Ban, Nar, Sejuani, and Rek'Sai, Fear Love's Scragus we're not really sure on. His, the two games he's played in the playoffs were not as good as, as some of the other big Gragas players we've seen. It's definitely not as good as his Sejuani or his Rek'Sai. So we're not sure how good he'll be on this champion, so maybe he'll pick that. He might also come out with like a more aggressive pick. It's really unclear, but try go, try going for that strategy and then banning the Nar, because I think the Nar is probably Edward Gaming's like most powerful champion. And then either pick away Jinx or Nunu. Since those champions are really, really high priority, it's likely that most teams against Edward Gaming at MSI will have compositions based on Jinx or Nunu. But letting them have both Jinx and Nunu can be very devastating in terms of how they use Baron and how they Siege, that would be my approach. And I think that because of their really, really strange strategy in terms of how they interact with Dragon and Baron, a lot of teams will underestimate their early game and the, a little bit think that their Dragon Control is, is an unintentional, like their lack of Dragon Control, when I really think it, it is a decision because we see it consistently, right, that they forego these, these Dragons after the first one. Predicting Edward Gaming will get second place, but I think it'll be really close just because their playstyle is so unique coming into MSI relative to GSM, who likes to team fight around Dragon, uh, Fnatic, who likes to team fight around Dragon, SK Telecom, who likes to team fight around Dragon, and have much more of an early to mid game fight focus. I think that d definitely, like for sure, SK Telecom and GSM are good at late game team fighting. But Edward Gaming is probably the best like mid to late game team fighting team, and I say mid to late game because again they don't want it to go late. They want to end the game before 30 minutes because they want to destroy your base with like the first or second Baron before you can get five dragons. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the Edward Gaming video. Jayo at EDG, Jayo, um, and, and good luck to all the other teams too.